unmute. Welcome to everybody, distinguished panelists, participants. A warm welcome here to this, our 13th webinar in the FAO COVID-19 and food system series in the Latin American and Caribbean. This webinar is made possible thanks to the joint collaboration between the FAO and the CARICOM Secretariat. Today's webinar will focuses on, will focuses on private sector investment in agriculture and fisheries on the, the preparation and the payoff. Without a doubt, the role of the private sector, investment and the overall economy faces significant challenges due to the disruptions and the shortages that could be caused by what we know this pandemic, COVID-19. Distinguished colleagues, today's webinar is timely and is important since it helps, helps to, to bring across the message of the new Director General as it relates to his vision for a dynamic FAO for a better world with all the actors involved in a common vision for development. And it fits timely into what the CARICOM vision is for the region under the CSME that deals with inclusive and participatory economic development for the CARICOM region. Today's webinar is being broadcast via the FAO YouTube channel and through the FAO's capacity building platform. For those participants who are registered through the FAO capacity building platform, you'll be able to obtain certificates for your participation. We also invite you to comment on this conference through our Twitter with the hashtag FAO CARICOM webinar and also investment private sector, as well as follow the accounts, accounts information at FAO Capacitation and FAO Americas. Also, don't forget to leave your queries for today's panelists, panelists in our YouTube chat. This webinar is expected and is scheduled to run for approximately an hour and we'll have two main parts. Firstly, we'll have four brief presentations to stimulate thought and discussion on the main issues. The second part, on the other hand, of this webinar is structured in a manner that allows questions for the distinguished panel of experts. The third part of, of the session, of session, of session will also be open where we'll take questions from our participants via our different um, platforms, YouTube, Twitter, and so forth. To get through the part, this packed agenda, I must say, it is in this limited time frame and allow for questions. I am requesting that all the panelists follow the timelines as, as assigned to your presentation. I will give a gentle reminder when there's two minutes remaining accordingly. With this being said, let us now introduce our first speaker and give welcome, and who will give welcome and opening remarks. Help me welcome Ms. Renata Clark, who is the FAO Sub-Regional Coordinator for the Caribbean. Over to you, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Sean. As you said, this is the 10th webinar in the series for Latin America and the Caribbean on COVID response and building back better after COVID. And it is the third of the FAO CARICOM webinars that have a focus on the Caribbean. In the first of the FAO CARICOM webinars, we looked broadly at the need to leverage investment in agriculture. There was a lot of interest expressed in exploring with greater focus the private sector investment and how this could be facilitated by an enhanced public-private interaction. So this is what we're delving into today. We have with us four panelists who will be presenting some of their perspectives and experiences on private sector investment in food and agriculture. They are Jose Alpuche, CEO, Ministry of Agriculture, Belize. Diane Edwards, President of Jamaica Promotions Corporation, JAMPRO in, Jam in Jamaica. <laughs> Mr. Keith Flett, Managing Partner, One Skip Fisheries Development. Mr. Ralph Birkoff, CEO of Alquimi Renewables. We also have four distinguished questioners who will each pose a question to one of the panelists. So I welcome as well, Joseph Cox, 
Assistant Secretary General for Trade and Economic Integration in CARICOM, Honorable Minister Michael Pintard, the Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources in the Bahamas, Luther Sintville, Senior Operations Officer of, for Agriculture at the Caribbean Development Bank, and Jeremy Stephen, a lecturer in economics at University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. I would also like to extend warm greetings to the public who are following us live through the FAO Capacity Building platform and on YouTube. Back over to you, Sean. Sean, you're on mute. Thank you, Renata. We'll move into our next presenter, Mr. Jose Alpuche. Mr. Alpuche is currently the CEO of the Ministry of Agriculture in Belize. He has a long history and a track record in the field of public policy and agriculture with, throughout the Caribbean and within Belize. Let us welcome Mr. Alpuche. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Morning again, fellow uh, panelists and participants in this webinar. Let me start sharing my screen here. I'm asked to, I've been asked to present on um, a, a perspective from Belize. Um, I think COVID-19 more than anything else uh, imposed a total uh, re-examination of agriculture in all our countries, and Belize is, of, of course, no different. Uh, what it highlighted were strengths and weaknesses in our food security system. Uh, we found out, quite frankly, that uh, in Belize's case, uh, we had uh, diversified input suppliers, so we were not impacted by, by temporary closures or temporary disruption from a particular country. However, um, as it relates to weaknesses, we found out that uh, storage capacity, for example, was an issue. Of course, this list is much longer than that, but I'm only using those two as examples. What it focused, it, it caused us to focus um, a bit more on the importance of, of domestic agriculture and food production. I'm quite uh, happy to say that the public um, were uh, engaged um, from the for at the forefront of this discussion. Here in Belize, it, it caused us immediately to convene a, a COVID-19 response team, which included public and private sector participants to look at food stock uh, availability and to plan to ensure that we had sufficient uh, uh, food for the domestic um, uh, population, but also to, uh, to examine closely what we were actually exporting. Of course, this was not an easy task because uh, borders were, were, were closing, opening. We had to work out uh, quite a bit of new protocols from the health standpoint, but also too from the trading standpoints. But I must say overall, uh, we found that our trading partners were, were, were quite accommodating as we uh, uh, had to be to them. Um, what it demonstrated though were was the need for additional investments in the in the sector. Uh, to start with, while Belize is is, is blessed by being self-sufficient in a number of uh, the basic commodities, it also showed that we do need to increase our buffer stocks. Um, I think one of the issues that we have to consider is that the pandemic, while it will be temporary, the effects will be long lasting and it will impact not only the public sector, but also the private sector. Uh, we will all need to find ways to pay the bills that we're, we're incurring right now. I, here in Belize, and I'm certain in, in most of the, uh, of the Car CARICOM region, uh, governments have had to actually raise debt to finance the response. Um, so we will need to pay the bills. What it means at the moment for us from a government perspective is an immediate 40% cut in budgets across the board. Um, and companies are also experiencing um, quite the same. However, the 
if there is a silver lining in this, is that in the Belize's case, we ensured very early on that a continuity plan was put in place for agriculture, that we do not stop uh, uh, um, production, even in the face of um, curfews, et cetera. Um, that brought us to, to developing a continuity plan. And what we now need to do is to develop a post-COVID continuity plan and to look at the longer term challenges uh, which will remain with us. The, the principal rule I believe is maintaining focus on confidence uh, going forward. And it is not something only for government, it is something that it's a responsibility that share, that's shared with government and the private sector. Our mantra has always been that agriculture is a business and it must be based on quality, consistency of supply and competitive pricing. I think going forward, as we, as I said earlier, seek to, to pay the bills, the, comp the competition will become much more uh, uh, stiff. And as you may know that prior to COVID-19, we already had requests from several uh, countries for access into the CARICOM market. I think it's essential that we strengthen um, our public-private uh, dialogue as consensus on policy priorities is essential, uh, both to look at policy responses, but to identify investment priorities and to ensure that there is complementarity in investment, both at the public and private sector. Uh, of course, market access and market penetration will also need to be increased. Another long running issue that we have to consider is the issue of environmental sustainability. Going forward, we believe that this will come under greater uh, um, scrutiny. We believe government's role to a large extent is to maintain an environment conducive to profitable and sustainable investments. Here we have been, and the, these are actually ongoing um, issues uh, with, with varying uh, degrees of implementation, but one of the key issues is the business environment. If agriculture is a business, the business environment must be conducive to, to, to it. In that, we're working very hard on tax reform to shift taxation from inputs to actually taxing at the output level. In effect, taxing success, not um, some of the crop failures that are, that are um, inherent in the, in the business that we're in. We're looking at contract farming legislation with the assistance of the FAO, looking at rap rapid dispute settlement mechanism things like investment incentives to ensure that they're available to all. And when I say all, uh, not only large, but large and small. One of the issues that came out is that we need to address much closer the equity in the business environment, both as it relates to foreign direct investments and, um, and domestic investments, but also to as it, rem as, it may, as it relates to large and small uh, investors. Of course, this will always be work in progress. Agriculture health. It is absolutely essential that if the governments have not invested in this, it is a must going forward. Um, we are lucky in the sense that we've invested in a, an independent statutory body. Um, they're now over 10 years old. Um, but what they've become is the competent authority with uh, technical expertise to be able to um, to regulate uh, food safety at the production level. Um, inv investments are, are advanced in this regard, but there's always... Sir Alpoche, you have two minutes left. Yes. Uh, reliable and timely data. We've invested in BEAMS uh, to do georeference data collection, a farmer registry, um, all aimed at collecting appropriate data for better decision making. This is a major goal that, we, that, that we've achieved. Uh, we're now working towards be, having the ability to do forecast supply balances. Um, we're building a foundation for digital and precision agriculture adaptation, uh, working with um, CDB and others to look at funding for LIDAR survey, georeference soils map, a national water management plan, spatial data infrastructure and remote sensing. Um, I will skip some of them. Uh, climate smart adaptation remains core to us and must remain core 
even in the, in the face of COVID-19. Uh, we're working on research with resi resilient uh, crop varieties, uh, drainage and irrigation, cover structure, and improved sustainable farming practices. Affordable financing is an issue, but I believe the best way to address this is not by hammering at the banks, it's at mitigating the risks associated with agriculture. And that is what all of our investments are, are about uh, um, at the moment. Um, one final point, uh, Sean, is the need at the governmental level, certainly here in Belize and uh, across the region to work um, for our governments to allocate resources to assist in quick payout uh, in the event of disaster. I think the current insurance scheme that we have operating in the region is uh, insufficient and we need to find new methods of uh, assisting the farming community in the event of disaster. So we absolutely need to look at disaster recovery fund. I will end there. I know my time is, is up. It's been rather quick. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Sir Alpuche. We will move directly into our next presenter. And this is Miss Diane, Diane Edwards. And she is the, the president of Jamaica Promotions Corporation, JAMPRO. This is a wealth of knowledge and experience in international marketing, business development. Mrs. Edwards, Ms. Edwards is committed to development and advancement of Jamaica's business brand. Mrs. Edwards, I turn over to you now. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Sean Baugh. Uh, let me just say thank you to the, um, the FAO and to CARICOM Secretariat for hosting um, this uh, event this morning and for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm very pleased to be talking to you about this morning about really private sector investment. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to find my, my uh, presentation here now. Um, private sector investment and what we are doing in Jamaica to develop that private sector investment. Um, I've lost my screen somehow. Um, so if essentially, I do have a PowerPoint, which I'm looking for now, it suddenly disappeared on me. There we go. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, we are seeing your screen. Okay, okay, excellent. You would, want uh, put, would ask you to put it in presentation yes. mode. Yes, there we go. There we go. So facilitating um, investments in agribusiness. I know the time I have is quite limited, so I'm going to whiz through this. Essentially, JAMPRO is uh, Jamaica's economic development agency. We promote investment and export. And agribusiness has been identified, particularly in the COVID period, as our um, priority sector. So what we do for investment is to make investments happen in agribusiness. We devise it, so we, we look for the concepts, we package it, we, we package projects and we package land and opportunity, and then we promote it and then we facilitate it. So we are really a full service organization. We are um, like Bell Trade. So very similar to uh, Belize and to many of our counterparts in the Caribbean, but we have export promotion and investment promotion. So a lot of what we do, and I very much appreciated that Minister Alpuche spoke to agriculture as a business, because we definitely see agriculture as a business and we're totally focused on improving the business environment for agriculture, but also in fostering the development of partnerships between large uh, farmers and small farmers to develop a more equitable approach to the industry. So specific services that we have offered to promote FDI in agribusiness, well, starting with business advocacy, this is the whole question of the business environment and how do we make the environment more attractive 
um, to investors in agribusiness. And there are a raft of, of policies which we have developed there. And some of them do involve um, tax incentives. They involve duty-free importation of equipment, a, a raft of different things. Business approvals, we make sure that companies get business approvals to do their business. We open up the market intelligence. We have done a whole set of studies through Euromonitor on different market opportunities in the international market that we feel Jamaican products can take advantage of. And we disseminate that information through workshops and seminars. Business matchmaking, we do a lot of business matchmaking through events and also on a direct one-to-one -one basis. So matching um, investors with site selection. So we do site selection for them. We get them technical assistance on whether the crops are suitable to that microclimate or to that soil type. We do capacity building for local entrepreneurs because we also work a lot with local entrepreneurs. And in terms of initiatives to stimulate agribusiness investments, as I said, we do actual investment profiles. So this one is just one of them looking at canned ackee and an opportunity, where is the opportunity for canned ackee. So we look, we go from the field to the consumer and the whole value chain and what are the opportunities along the value chain. We host a lot of investment fora, we host seminars, we host workshops. And we um, work with the Ministry of Industry, um, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries to develop our agro parks. We have nine agro parks in Jamaica and more to come. And irrigation is one of the critical inputs into that. And so one of our projects, um, which is listed there, Isra Tech actually develops um, irrigation solutions for both small and large farms. And so you're looking there at um, drip irrigation solution from Israel Tech. So where is the sector now? Where is our agriculture sector now? Well, at the moment, agriculture is 7.1% of GDP in Jamaica, but manufacturing, which is 8.5%, a lot of manufacturing is actually agro-processing. So we really need to look as, at agriculture along the whole value chain and to understand that a lot of what we call manufacturing is agro-processing and that we need to build the production um, and expand the production because our production needs to go more into value-added production. So looking at our foreign direct, man, direct investment inflows by industry, you see well, there that- I'm sorry to interrupt, but you got two minutes. Three yes. Minutes. Thank you. We have um, agriculture is a very important component in that FDI um, scenario. So in terms of target markets, we have really looked a lot at the key overseas markets as opportunities, but we are now working on import substitution, agro-processing and services to the tourism trade, which is a real opportunity. What is it we need to be able to revolutionize agriculture? More large scale farms, potentializing the agro parks, improving the internal and external logistics, because that's a critical element. Looking at some of the, and I'll just go through this real quick, because we have now, what is really interesting is the picture is changing. You're getting some large companies now, like this one, AgriVentures Limited, going into backward linkages and looking at the agribusiness space and going for greenhouses, open fields and orchards as a combination of all of them to service the market. Another one would be model agricultural production. And this is a huge farm, 2,850 acres. And you can see there with Israeli technology doing a raft of different products. So post COVID, there are some new factors, really. We have worked with excess supply situations. We've done home deliveries, farmers markets. We're capitalizing on the healthy eating. And we've done a project, a whole campaign called Say Yes to Fresh, and importantly looked at divesting the sugar lands because that's where a lot of agricultural lands were tied up. So these are a list of things that we need to improve. Um, I have 
time to go into all of them, but I've talked about some of them already, like agroparks, private equity, financing, crop insurance. This is a critical one. We have to improve the crop insurance and the security if we want to, to really change farming in the region. So looking ahead, we see the opportunity for more branding of our fresh produce, building the agro-processing sector, the local linkages, more ag tech that is going to be really, really critical. Looking at new ways of marketing through healthy foods, organics, um, fair trade, etc., and greater focus on food security. So, thank you very much, and interested in the questions that will come. Thank you, Miss Edwards, for your your very insightful and informative presentation. We're going to move quickly to Mr. Keith Flett who is actually the managing director of one of One Skip Fisheries Development. He has over 17 years of financial, financial and fisheries innovation. Let us welcome Mr. Flett as he, he, as he presents to us. Thank you. Go ahead, Keith. Keith, I think you're on mute. Here we go, can you hear me? I assume that's better. Um, well, thank you FAO and CARICOM for uh, the opportunity to present today. I'm excited to share what we've been doing in uh, Grenada and across the Caribbean um, in fisheries development. Uh, today we'll be speaking about making public and private partnerships uh, in fisheries work, which is a, uh, a complex scenario, especially if you've been involved in fisheries for a while. Um, so a quick intro uh, to One Skip Development. We have 60 collective years in experience in seafood and fisheries sectors uh, between me and my two other business partners. Uh, we have specialties in fisheries, economics, sustainability, fish processing, finance, and technology, all specific to fisheries sector. Um, we've been leading the sector in designing and implementing and investing in public-private partnerships for fisheries development. And we've established the Caribbean Blue label uh, to support multiple projects in the Caribbean as they explore new export markets. So the real problem that our company focused on is what we call the blue versus growth problem or the public private good nexus, which is when profits compete with uh, sustainability and with the goals of the public sector. And really what we've tried to focus in on is the fact that the private sector can't afford to pay for enabling conditions that support sustainability, nor is it the private sector's job to do so. And likewise, the public sector cannot finance private profits and projects are inherently not financially stable and nor is it their job to be. So what we've done is we've looked at different models that you can build uh, alignment between the public and private sector. And when we began to do this, uh, we looked at uh, the formation of public-private partnerships. And the fact is that they're actually old news. Um, this is from a World Bank diagram of how public-private partnerships are formed. And what we've done is we looked at how they're actually built and the multiple arrays from 100% owned by government all the way to 100% owned by the private sector and tried to build on what current models were out there. And this includes wastewater treatment plants, building roads, and these kinds of projects that have been happening throughout the world. Um, and what we've done is we looked at that array and developed a new solution that can be applied to fisheries. And really in our perspective, uh, aligning blue growth uh, or the sectors is really about how industry profits can be completely aligned with public, public sector goals and really how one can build on another. So when the two are aligned, you're working together in harmony to actually achieve both goals of the private sector, which is profit driven and sustainability driven in some circumstances, and the public sector, which is looking at better managing their fisheries and better implementation of the projects that they're currently trying to build. And in fisheries specifically, uh, and especially during COVID-19 time, we really look at how we can build a more profitable structure for both the fishers, as well as for the exporters in this current market circumstance. And how we've done this is we've aligned uh, robust legislation that we actually made mandatory based on industry investments, meaning the government uh, had to work with the private investors in order to understand what the expectations of them were from a sustainability standpoint to protect the resource. And on top of that, we've then aligned vessel payments to the monitoring control and surveillance data. So fishermen are uh, incentivized to report their landings and report their data to the governments. 
And then building on that, we go to vessel bonuses that are based on compliance with the sustainability standards and the product quality. And what this allowed for is a alignment between the public and the private sector in order to leverage each other's goals in order to create a blue growth model. Um, and what it also allowed is for pay for performance models to be built inside of uh, how people's actions are helping either sustainability or helping the private sector with the product quality. And this enables the government to control and monitor their fisheries well and allows industry to be working hand in hand with the, their blue growth models. So how you do that uh, is kind of the hard part. And when you have alignment, at least on the core of what you're trying to achieve from both the public and a private sector uh, perspective, what we then do is we look at the project execution itself. And what our company does is we go into the assessment of how the fishery is currently operating. And then we come up with blue growth plans for the fishery sector specifically. And when we do that, we also outline what kind of capital can pay for kind, what kind of things, getting back to that public private good nexus of how do you use private capital and how do you use public capital to align for the goals of both sectors. And essentially what we've done is we've broken into three big chunks where we look at NGO and IGO grant type capital that looks at de-risking projects and delivering public goods and services in forms of assessments, government infrastructure, work planning, and finding alignment between the stakeholders. And we look at this as kind of the loss leader. Uh, from a public, from a private sector investment standpoint, this is where a lot of the risk is if you're trying to go into a public-private partnership, is working with governments and working with stakeholders on how you can actually create an investment model that pushes things forward. And if that deal ends up not going through, that's lost capital to the private sector. So when the public sector can help finance those types of conversations and those kinds of assessments, it allows the private sector to engage a little bit more deeply without having to burn their own capital that then becomes a loss when the project is starting to move or when it doesn't move. From there, we look at loans and low interest capital from foundations and DFIs, and whether that's going through uh, local uh, development banks or whether that's going through multilaterals, uh, what we look to do is then absorb those uh, still risky type costs in uh, the structure. If you have two minutes, sorry to interrupt, you got two minutes. Okay, excellent. Uh, and then finally, we look at industry and private investment of where the actual return is going to happen. So looking at digital infrastructure, at value add facilities, in our case, it's looking at uh, processing facilities, uh, fish processing facilities across multiple different countries, and how they can actually align to the sustainability goals of the governments themselves. And the last slide is about the practical approach of how to do this. For us, we start with assessments. We look at the non-recoverable project assessment costs and we work with fisheries ministries in order to assess a fishery to then look at the potential that it has for blue growth, including alignment of the stakeholders. Then we go into structuring. And what OneSkip does is we look to give a four to one match based on the assessment costs. So essentially when we go in and assess, we'll be willing to put four to one in those assessment costs up in investment if the project can move forward which allows us then to create special purpose vehicles and move the project forward and actually invest in those project companies once they're up, which puts the risky capital at play. Well, thank you for your time. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you much, Keith, for that presentation. Quite insightful and again, informative. Just to let everyone know that across our YouTube and our Twitter platforms, we just have a little bit less than 400 participants, which I think is remarkable. I want us to move directly now into our next presenter, our next speaker, that's Mr. Ralph Berkoff. And Mr. Berkoff is the co-founder and chief commercial officer for Alcumi Renewables LLC, and it's a US Caribbean based project development and holding company, which specializes in climate resilience, resilient protected agriculture, integrated renewable energy systems in the Caribbean and offers a global view to agricultural production and agricultural innovation. I now turn over to you, Ralph. You have seven minutes and I'll inform you when you have two left. Go ahead, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right, 10 minutes has already shrunk to seven, so I'm going to move quickly here. I'm typically at the back end of things. So uh, let me get uh, started right away. Um, all right, we, um, our company is, is 
focused on the vegetable production sector. Um, we are um, going to take you through a, some insight in terms of uh, how we have experienced our um, interaction with investors uh, to try to draw investment into the Caribbean region. Um, so I'm not going to get into too much introduction other than I've been here for a long time, uh, working 25 years in the Caribbean, and um, I've also been working on some IPA capacity building. So I've, I've sat on both sides of the table. What we're doing now, uh, Alchemy and Island Growers, is developing a series of commercial farms across the region. These are greenhouse farms, hydroponic greenhouse farms. Everything we do is 100% hydroponic uh, grown. Um, how we've managed to uh, move forward on this is by engineering the first Category 5 hurricane resistant greenhouse system in the world. Uh, we've raised uh, just over almost a million and a half in private equity that, uh, over the last six to eight months. Uh, we're currently in talks uh, with uh, several other uh, equity uh, capital partners to raise approximately 1.2 million to start projects in Bar Bahamas, Barbados, and Cayman. We've also uh, established a financing allocation with a Caribbean-based investment group, uh, a bank group, uh, up to $3 million per project. So we have the, um, we have the scope to move forward very quickly now. Um, what, is, what is it that capital gets interested in? And, and these are a, a list of, of sort of the top seven or eight uh, issues that they look at, and, and it can be in any different order. Um, investors look at things different ways, but you know, critical need, what's the market space? Um, is there enough product demand in the, in the region? Uh, is the ROI strong enough? What's the competition look like? Um, what kind of production methods are you using to create your product? How bulletproof is that? Do you have any proprietary technologies? Um, creates a first to market opportunity. And then finally, a combination of insurability, scalability, and experience management. Um, we've dealt with probably 200 to 300 uh, private capital investors over the last few years. So we've got a lot of interesting feedback from them. I'm gonna try to share that with you. So let's look at critical need. We all know that um, the import uh, food demand in the region is very high. We're at uh, uh, approaching $6 billion a year and approximately 1.6 billion of that is in fresh produce. This is what we're in, uh, certainly focused at. And the trend is going up significantly. Um, you know, the FAO stats, uh, we were you know, looking at uh, about 20, uh, I'm sorry, we're looking at, uh, um, you know, about uh, $6 billion this year, and it's, it's come up about $4 billion over the last uh, 10 years or so. The other opportunity is Forex savings and export. Um, all, all the Caribbean islands are looking for opportunities in Forex savings and export to create Forex opportunities. I pulled up this stat quickly because um, Bermuda is one of the few islands that we have engaged with that actually has a custom department with up-to-date statistics. So this just gives you a, a quick picture. An island of only 65,000 people, about 270,000 uh, overnight stays are producing or importing 27 million pounds a year. And that was in 2018. But just to give you an idea of, of, of the scale of things. So small island, uh, you know, importing a tremendous amount of fresh produce. On the other side, we've got um, product demand. Who are the buyers um, that you're going to sell to? And in this case, we've got food importers and wholesalers across the region, um, supermarkets, resorts, restaurants, agro-processing companies, cruise supply. These are all our potential off-takers that we look at. And they're significant, and they've been in business a long time, so they have a very strong covenant for investors, which is a, another uh, critical point they look at. ROI. Um, you know, long-term IRRs are expected over a 25-year term. Uh, investors look at, at long-term returns. Um, they, they want to um, uh, see short-term revenue to cover operational uh, expenditures. Um, in, in the U.S., you know, greenhouse, large greenhouse projects are, are being invested in at, at about a 19 to 22% ROI. Um, we've got to get a little higher than that here to cover some of the risk mitigation. Uh, investors want to look at scalability. Um, 
put in the original investment, but what's the scalability? How big can we grow? And what are the downstream opportunities? In this case, we're looking at agro-processing opportunities where we can actually create uh, a produce stream to drive um, future agro-processing um, opportunities for export. And while they're not, you know, 100% risk mitigated, investors like to see as close to 100% risk mitigation as possible. The agricultural sector here in the region, you know, we're all very uh, well aware of what the risks are. Investors know this too. Um, you want to ask them to invest in agriculture and they're going to challenge you on all of these threats, hurricanes, flood, drought, pestilence. Pradial larceny has become an issue. We've got these, uh, our monkey friends in St. Kitts causing problems. So um, crop loss is loss of revenue. And that's a risk factor in investment that they will all look out very closely. Ralph, you have two minutes. Okay, thanks, Sean. So what have we done? Um, we've tried to get rid of the risks. Um, we've developed the protected infrastructure that is now hurricane resistant. It's also earthquake resistant, corrosion resistant, pestilent resistant, basically eliminates all of the risks from the previous slide. Into that, we've integrated a high yield uh, hydroponic production system, also customized for the region for the subtropical growing conditions. Very energy and water efficient, highly programmable. Um, our farms will be USDA organic certified and we will meet all global gap food quality standards. We need to show scalability. So we uh, approach it on a crawl, walk, run basis. We start relatively small at a five, 10,000 square foot greenhouse, but we can scale up extremely quickly. This is all rapid deployment engineering. So we look to diversify the crop mix, add various crops, including peppers, berries, tomatoes, and obviously increase the volume of supply. So in a, in a typical scenario, uh, you know, we would get up to over a million pounds per, uh, of produce per year. What do foreign investors think? Well, this is the way they, you know, and this is all feedback from these, you know, uh, hundreds of meetings that we've had. You know, this is foreign investment are looking at the region. They see geopolitical instability, election cycle risk, um, implementation speed, uh, scale, the limited scale. If you look at the, each Caribbean island, there's limited scale as a, as a region, there's substantial scale. Um, protection for IP and technologies and, and profit rep repatriation. So these are the issues we have to deal with. Diane and Jampro have done a really good job on this, but we've, you know, this is a quick checklist. What, how can governments, what can governments do to enhance their position to attract investment and in, uh, private investment? Um, appoint a professional ag sector specialist. You want to get people in, somebody who's been in the business, who understands the business locally, bring them on board. Um, create a farming license system. Uh, data is critical. Um, you know, very difficult to get current data on food imports. And when I say current, uh, we want to see last year's imports. And broken down by each crop category. This gives us the ability to scale the project. Um, ease of business, uh, online accessibility, uh, create a list of potential off takers, uh, you know, matchmaking as, as, as Diane mentioned, uh, partnered uh, investment partner video. Who's who's a local potential investment partner? We like to you know, partner with local investors, either landowners, capital partners, uh, or off takers. Um, obviously, education, streamline utility connections. Like we got to you know people want to move fast. Investors want to come in. They want to build. They want to get going fast. We don't want to be held up for three or four months to get a utility connection. And look at it creating opportunity zone specific to agro processing. Um, Sean and I have talked about and thrown around ideas about building a P3 model in the region. And, you know, we have all the players here. We have all a lot of experience here with the FAO and the ICA. Uh, we have a UE system. We have an education system. So we need to try to create a strategy and build a model for the Caribbean that brings all of these partners together. And I think that we can do that. Um, here's an, a quick example of a major project just announced in Kentucky, where the government of Kentucky partnered with the government of the Netherlands. So there's a lot of a technology exchange here. There's a lot of capital exchange. There's you know land. This is going to be a massive project. They're building a you know two and a half million square foot greenhouse just to start the project and bring all these technology uh, leaders together. And this is the way we kind of think about the world uh, here, especially in the Caribbean. There's, you know, two ways of doing things in the world, the right way or again. So we like to start off by doing it the right way. So anyway, thanks very much for your time.
Thank you very much, Ralph. Again, that that is that was also an insightful and useful, informative presentation and a new way of looking at, at things. I'd like to also remind our participants that you can follow us on our on our various social media platforms at hashtag FAO CARICOM webinar, hashtag investment private sector, and also follow us on our accounts, FAO Americas. And just to say that we have just over 520 persons on the platforms who are tuned in and participating in this webinar. We're now gonna move into the second part of the webinar, which, which is the second exciting part. And we have assembled a team of, of experts who have formulated questions who, and they'll deliver such questions to our panelists. We have the Honorable Minister Pinta, Minister of Agriculture and Marine Resources in the Bahamas. We have Mr. Luther Sandville, and he's a Senior Operations Officer, Agriculture from the Caribbean Development Bank. And we have Mr. Jeremy Stephen, and he's an economy, a well-known economist throughout the region. I'll move directly into our first question, which will be posed by Minister Pintard to Keith Flett. Go ahead, Minister. Minister, you're on mute. You're on mute, Minister. You're on mute. Yes, I'd like to say a special thank you to all of the panelists for a very insightful presentation. I think you have gone back on mute, Minister. You want to mute me, unmute again, Minister? Yes, are you able to hear me clearly? This is much better. Go ahead, Minister. Wonderful. Thank you very much once again for the insightful presentation. Uh, my, my question relates to funding uh, using the government lease system as a means of uh, attracting uh, foreign direct investment. In the Bahamas, as in some of the countries in the region, you have the option of receiving land lease or seabed lease, depending on the nature of your uh, development project. I would like to uh, hear Mr. Fleet's uh, thought in terms of setting up private investment funds where government property, whether it is a land lease arrangement or whether it is acreage on land for aquaculture, et cetera, uh, in fact, uh, placed in a special purpose vehicle along with business profiles in order to raise capital. Is he familiar with that formula? Does he believe it has viability in the region given what he knows about land tenure laws in, in the Caribbean? That's a, a wonderful question. And while we have some uh, overlap with that question, um, we are very fisheries focused. So for land leases specifically, we don't necessarily get into that component. Um, I am uh, knowledgeable and know of some um, quota based programs where countries will uh, put up some of their fish stocks in order for foreign companies to invest and capture those fish stocks. But that is not at all what we try to do with, um, in our projects whatsoever. Um, we are more about uh, financing the current fishing fleets and the current fishing vessels to fish more sustainably um, than acquiring uh, government assets in order to do so. Um, but on the other hand, within this region, um, there are a lot of government assets and a lot of government infrastructure that was paid for and developed uh, by multiple development agencies uh, throughout the region, um, such as JICA, building uh, processing facilities and processing infrastructure in multiple countries. That, on the other hand, we uh, always take a look at in our assessment process to see if it can be better utilized than it currently is, especially for reaching export markets and especially for better food safety standards um, and application of better technology uh, for data collection. And in that regard, uh, in two of the islands we've gone to, we've uh, focused directly on those facilities and investing in those facilities directly um, through a partnership with the governments to help advance those processing facilities. And that's done through through a cash lease um, based on uh, them leasing to the private sector those assets. Um, some of it is about sharing some of those assets where um, the private sector, we won't take them over completely, but we will share like ice making um, and responsibility and we'll pay a fee for that kind of stuff. Um, 
So while we stay very far away from um, quota and land assets and that kind of stuff, uh, we definitely look at infrastructure assets. Um, that also gets down to dockage and uh, a lot of the um, facilities are built on um, public docks and fishermen land on public docks and building tax models that actually help with the uh, uh, maintenance of those types of assets as well. Thank you much, Keith. Minister, I'll ask you to, to pose your second question to Jose Alpuche from Belize. You're, you're on mute again, Minister. Uh, I'm aware I, just before you go, Minister, yeah. could I ask the, the panelists to just keep the response as, as short as possible as we want to take some questions from our participants. Thank you. Yes, uh, Belize has an amazing uh, track record in working with multinational organizations in terms of attracting uh, funding, uh, also doing joint ventures. Uh, can you shed some light on initiatives that have been successful, uh, whether in Belize or across the region, where we have increased youth engagement, both in the agriculture and fisheries sector, uh, given the fact that there is an aging population, both in agriculture and in uh, the fishery sector, and comment in the process on how those youth initiatives are funded uh, so that it generates greater interest of young people to participate in both of those areas, fisheries as well as agriculture. Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, uh, we have been, um, we've, we've go, gone back uh, to the drawing board with, with the youth engagement, um, and we're looking at non-traditional areas. What we have decided to focus on is to reintroduce uh, agriculture at the primary school level um, uh, through a covered structure, um, protected gardening, et cetera, um, usually complement complementing uh, school feeding programs um, so that we can, out of, out of those, out of that captive audience within a school environment, um, we can indeed attract uh, farming, new farmers with, with, uh, with a business mindset to a large extent. Uh, we've had very good cooperation with the Ministry of Education. While it, it has not been included as a core part of the curriculum, they use it as a training tool for science, uh, mathematics, and even, even basic business. Um, and I think that that is absolutely key because if we wait too long to capture the mind of the youths, they would be engaged in other things uh, uh, that, that distract them away from, from agriculture. Um, that's been our experience. Um, we also too recognize uh, our, our youth in, in all our awards that we present, the Youth Farmer of the Year, Young Farmer of the Year example, um, Female Farmer, we try to diversify the base and open up um, both the business opportunities, but also the recognition at all levels. Um, but I would suggest, or I would want to think um, that by introducing a wider um, um, audience through the primary school might be the best way to, to collect our future farmers. Thank you very much, Mr. Alpuche. We'll move now to Luther Saintville to pose his question to Ralph Burkoff. Go ahead, Luther. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, greetings all, and thank you, panelists, for your diverse and thought-provoking presentations. Um, so, Ralph, I note and appreciate the important role which businesses such as yours could play in developing technical solutions that could be of benefit to the agribusiness sector in the Caribbean. Now, we are also aware that the agribusiness enterprises in the Caribbean are in the main classified as small and medium sized. Now, a key component of the work of multilateral development banks, as it relates to the agricultural sector, is strengthening agri sector SMEs. And that support is often channeled through national financial institutions. 
Now, we believe that growth in this sector must be inclusive. So my question, what suggestions would you have for national financial institutions and related agencies to improve their product and service offerings for SMEs in the agribusiness sector to better enable those SMEs to take advantage of innovative technolo technologies such as yours? Thank you. Uh, well, that's a big question. Um, one of the things that, um, that we're very cognizant of is, is obviously working with the existing farmers who focus mainly on indigenous crop production. Um, uh, our focus is, is really on the imported crops. So we're looking at a, at a comprehensive uh, agricultural solution. Um, I think where, you know, where we look to assist beyond job creation and skill creation is bringing some of the expertise uh, from our, our master growers and our farm managers to bear on local uh, production so that, so that investors that are interested in the, in the sector will, we can help basically de-risk de the sector through technology. So a lot of that's happening already. Uh, we're seeing the, you know, the, the project that Diane mentioned in, uh, in Jamaica with the irrigation system. So a lot of it's infrastructure based. Um, but I think if we can bring a lot of different technologies in, in uh, security systems, crop monitoring, weather monitoring, protected agriculture, uh, all of these to bear on all facets of agriculture throughout every island, uh, then we can raise the interest level of the, uh, of the investor community. I think we have to prove that we can do it and then the money will, will come. Thank you, Ralph. We now move to Jeremy Stevens, who will pose his question to the president of Jampro, Diane Edwards. Go ahead, Jeremy. Hey, good afternoon, Diane. And thank you for a very insightful presentation. I've actually been doing some research on Jamaica's recovery efforts in agriculture. And it was very impressive to hear this very well thought of approach. It was good to hear that agriculture is continually seen as a priority. It differs tremendously from how we think in Barbados, sad to say. Uh, the question I do have to ask, however, is if Jampro and any other investment houses there in Jamaica, have you guys considered uh, combining your efforts to actually create financial instruments that could either be resold on the secondary markets in Jamaica or to the wider diaspora? Uh, knowing that you can capitalize on the fact that, you know, a significant part of the Jamaican GDP relies on remittances. So as opposed to remittances being used for consumptive purposes, it could be used for investment purposes on something that Jamaica deems a priority. Thanks for the question, uh, Jeremy. Yes, we are actually working with um, a company out of Washington called Home Strings to really look at how can we repurpose and create special purpose vehicles for the diaspora investment as a channel to bring that into productive investment because most diaspora investment goes into consumption. The second thing that we're doing is trying to bring diaspora people to focus on land that they have in Jamaica, which is not productive, and how do we help them to get that land into production. And the third thing is there is a company out of New York called Farm Up Jamaica, which will actually lease land from owners and put it into production on their behalf. So yes, there's a lot of activity in that field. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, we're now going to move into um, questions and answers from our participants on our social media platform. And we, we are now steadily heading towards the 600 mark in terms of the, the amount of participants. The first question that, that is being posed to the panelists here is, is one that I find interesting and provocative. And it is, which areas of agriculture give more gives more opportunities for young entrepreneurs? And I, I'd like the panelists to give some response to that. Well, I'm happy to start with um, one answer. Um, you know, 
big part of our social mandate is to attract the youth men and women back into agriculture. I think but by introducing new technologies and clean working environments um, in our greenhouse systems that we uh, uh, we will do that. We already have been doing that. Um, we've got uh, a lot of interest from uh, the young folks here in Anguilla to get uh, a part of that, to become a part of that. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I mean, young people love technology. They love new technology. So if you're creating a clean lab environment where you're growing using state-of-the-art uh, type of systems, um, we can we can drive that interest back and, and, and also certify them at a higher level of... Uh, uh, of technical training so that if they do want to work somewhere else in the world, they have that ability as well. Um, we are finding in Jamaica quite a lot of interest in herbs and um, specialized vegetables. So particularly for gourmet restaurants and the tourism industry. So mini vegetables, Indian vegetables, and, and specialized vegetables, and then the range of herbs from, you know, dill to um, uh, parsley to whatever, um, because these are higher value items than the typical cash crops. Keith? I'll actually double down on what Ralph said. Uh, the introduction of new technologies in specifically the fisheries sector um, is driving a lot of youth excitement. Um, you see younger fishermen entering the fisheries and talking about how they can engage, especially from a marketing end. Um, digital traceability technology definitely helps uh, the supply chain work more efficiently and uh, with new food safety protocols coming in from all different directions, especially in this time of COVID, um, the reliance on technology to drive your supply chains is going up, which is engaging a lot of uh, young fishermen uh, to engage more. Jose? Actually, I would have to add to the uh, a third voice to that, to that bit about technology. Um, that's where we see quite a bit of, of of interest um, as it relates to app development, et cetera. But beyond that, it's the more uh, automated um, farming system, farming systems. And in that, it's mainly vegetable production that you would find uh, those technologies being, being applied. Thank, thank you, Jose. I, I, got, I got, I'm seeing quite a lot of questions here, but I, I can only choose one more. And I think this one is fitted. And it's asking, could any of the panelists briefly describe any concrete or administrative tools that might facilitate direct investment from the private sector in regional agricultural development? I think Ralph wants to start. Well, that's... Uh... That's a great idea, and, and wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do that, if we could uh, create a portal that was very specific to, to regional, you know, a lot of our investment is regional investment. We, we were thrilled um, to, to, to find partners here in the region, private equity partners right here in the region who understood the dynamics here. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, as a, as a, as a region, put together a portal um, you know that could attract both investment and investors that are would be specific to the uh, agricultural sector that that'd be just amazing and and that's i think part of what we want part of what we want to achieve in the, in this whole p3 structure the center of excellence uh, incubator program with uh, with investor portals for direct access to the to the capital i think from the jamaican point of view what we need to do is to get the private equity people more interested in agriculture. We have a very vibrant stock market in Jamaica, as you all know, um, and we have developed the junior stock exchange, which is what is really driving the potential. We, are now, we have now developed a social stock exchange. So what we really need to do is get the agricultural people in touch with the private equity. And I think this could be done on a regional basis as well, because you really need to look at pooling risk. Risk is a real reason why most of our financiers won't get involved in agriculture. So we have to look at crop insurance and we have to look at pooling risk. And I think if we, if we are able to do that, we can start to see the development of special purpose vehicles for agricultural investment. 
Oh, so I see you're, 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 you want, you're wanting to get in and also Keith. Well, I, I thought uh, in one of the previous uh, webinars, we had a presentation from a young lady in, in Jamaica that was utilizing blockchain technology to um, attract um, investment, but also to, to provide traceability in terms of the investments. And I really thought that that was a very innovative idea. I can't recall the name of the of the of the company. Excuse me, but um, again, there are multiple tools being utilized, uh, virtual tools being utilized right now to raise um, finances, even within uh, the domestic market. And I really believe we have to focus a lot on the um, domestic market, especially uh, uh, post COVID where there's a heightened awareness of the need for us to improve our agriculture and, and food supply. Keith? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with where this is going with uh, some kind of regional tool to direct investment towards these type of opportunities. Um, right now, the current financial landscape isn't showing any returns on any markets really. So I think there's a really interesting uh, ability for us right now to market these very unique sectors that are looking to grow and have the opportunities to grow, especially through technologies. Uh, so I think that uh, while a lot of the well-known markets are not doing so well and potentially rebounding a little bit, I think the sector has a very unique opportunity of reaching out to, uh, to attract capital types. Um, and I also think looking at some kind of underwriting of DFI type finance or grant type capital to reduce that risk, which is in, definitely inherent in fisheries and agriculture, um, to help provide far, first loss, um, to minimize the potential downturn um, that something fun like this could have. Thank you, if, I could just quickly add, if I could just quickly add one more thought, I think uh, what is required is that all our governments um, in the ministries of agriculture uh, implement a business reform agenda because we tend to focus more on the agronomic side of it, which is absolutely necessary. Um, and we, we leave the business environment to others. And as I had said in my presentation, that's one of the areas as it relates to tax reform, incentives, et cetera, that I believe that the ministries of agriculture absolutely need to get a proper handle on. Thank you, Jose, and also to the other panelists. And, and importantly, thank you to our participants who posed dozens of questions on our social, various social media platform. I'd also like to tell you, if you want to revisit or watch this webinar again, you can do so at fao.org slash Americas or on the FAO core platform for training and public policy. Um, I will now turn you over to a lady that has brought a level of enthusiasm and, and energy towards to, in the region at the FAO sub-regional office. And she will bring closing remarks. And this is Dr. Renata Clark. Go ahead, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, panelists. Thank you, questioners. You didn't disappoint. So a few points that I've that I've picked up during the presentations, that the first point is that there is plenty of scope, it would seem, for domestic and regional business growth in agriculture. Some of the participants pointed to the starting level of, of food imports, you know, so there's, and there's a big interest in us reducing those food imports to create employment, but also to reduce foreign exchange expenditure on things that are unproductive. So there's a, a, a big space, high food, high and growing food imports. But wanting local and regional business to succeed is, is, is not enough. You know, how do we create a context where this is possible? And from the public sector side, we heard a lot of ideas about what a, a, a creative and and self-renovating public sector is doing in terms of finding ways to de-risk, ensuring that they are enabling market access by doing investments in public goods like agricultural uh, health, looking for new financial instruments that could, that could promote investment, 
supporting innovation, promoting local production, including building the capacities of entrepreneurs. So, you know, there's a lot happening, it would seem, from the public sector side to understand how do we enable what we need. But we've heard today as well from a very responsible and progressive private sector, which is always great to hear. It's not the wild, wild west. We don't want business at any cost. We want responsible businesses. And what I, I would like to steal a phrase. I think it came from Keith. Isn't it great when the private sector comes up with business models that where the thinking behind it is aligning industry and private profit with public sector goals? Isn't that a win-win? So we've seen you know, an emphasis on inclusive growth emphasis on how can these businesses also ensure and facilitate environmental sustainability. So a lot of good ideas, leveraging new technologies to solve old problems. So we have a lot of good ideas and creative thinking. There is one point that was addressed at the end that I was planning to ask, but, but we heard it from you. What's the regional dimension? In the Caribbean, the regional dimension is so critically important. We've seen, we've seen the proactivity of the CARICOM Secretariat in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic, and we need a lot more. We, there is a lot to be gained by all countries by creating this additional facilitating benefit at the regional level. So um, I've learned a lot, and we know that in the Caribbean, in order to diversify, so COVID has put that magnifying glass on, on our agricultural sectors, and it tells us we've been giving lip service to diversification, we've been giving lip service to resilience, we really do need to invest in resilience and in a, a resilient and sustainable agricultural sector. Back over to you, Sean. Thank you, Dr. Clark. This has now brought us to the end of our webinar. I, I wanna thank the panelists. I wanna thank the team of experts who have asked the questions. I wanna thank our participants. I'm told now we're close to 600. And just to let you know, we appreciate your, your, your time coming in and listening to what we have to say. And just to let you know, we have other upcoming webinars that will be of interest as we try to, from a collective point of view, um, address the different food security and agricultural related challenges from COVID-19. I wish you all a great day and thank you once more.